Good morning and welcome. It's wonderful to see a live audience. It's packed house. Anyway, I'm very pleased that we have both doctors, Stephen Beasley and Dr. Bob Weathers, that are part of our faculty, uh, to present today. I welcome all of you attending virtually as well in our live streaming audience. And you can see that this topic mm is uh, very important to most of the world <laughs> for all seven continents, I think, except for Australia. But look at the reach of this. So even in Russia, this is amazing. And France is new, I want you to note. <laughs> anyway, I'm just so pleased we have at least 150 to 175 people online. So I'm very pleased that we have a worldwide audience from North America, South America, Africa, Taiwan, India, much of Europe and as I said France no <laughs> as you know Cal Southern is part of our global community with participants in our master lecture series that um, are in over 71 different countries and the intent of our series is to help create a global community of like-minded individuals in order to provide training to our students and to the community at large of our most effective treatment modalities today Topics educate and keep us abreast of our current trends in practice, research, and scholarship to enhance personal enrichment and the professional development of our learners as well as to the world at large. Our master lecture series, speakers become part of our global community and our global outreach for educational excellence. We live in an exciting time with the explosion of technology, social media, and, neuro and research in neuroscience, interpersonal neurobiology, boy, interpersonal biology, and mindfulness that has revolutionized the way we think about our brains, our relationships, and our world. Like Mona de Fishbane, who proposes in her book, Loving with the Brain in Mind, that the brain is adaptable. That gives us hope that human beings can, in effect, change. Human beings are hardwired for social interaction. Today's topic, the therapeutic value of silence, is a welcome one. From Albert Ellis's dropping out of Harvard in the 60s and urging us all to be here now, uh, to the latest scientific breakthroughs in brave, brave, boy, breakthroughs with brainwave entrainment where individuals learn how to change their state of mind or their brain frequencies and replicate deep seats of consciousness that the yogis of old have been doing for centuries. And we can do it, they say, in a few weeks' time. I'm doing some research, I'll let you know. <laughs> Today's topic will explore how to live more soul soulfully from a deeper sense of imagination in moments of silence, in moments of stillness, in moments between moments, to deepen the connection, trust, and love in our relationships to our intimate others and within ourselves in body, mind, and spirit. Silence in the Space Between was first published in 1998 as Dr. Beasley's doctoral dissertation, earning him a PsyD in clinical psychology. And as an aside, Dr. Weathers just happened to be his chair at Pepperdine University. So I, I think that the fates are with us today. <laughs> now, after 16 years, he's returning to the topic of silence and is artfully crafting his dissertation into a book. Dr. Beasley's professional experience is highly eclectic. He worked as a professional actor, university professor, and was president and CEO of an arts and entertainment center that included over an 8,500-seat amphitheater featuring some of the biggest musical artists in the world. He earned a PsyD, as I mentioned, from Pepperdine University. School of Education and Psychology, where he also served as a professor. We're pleased to announce he's joined our faculty. I didn't know I was going to say it earlier, but anyway, I'm pleased that he's here. As well as he'll be teaching as the doctoral project chairs 
as well as a committee member in our doctoral project courses. So we're very pleased to have him. He owns a consulting firm called Lean Forward that specializes in arts and entertainment and in education. Now a little bit about our illustrious Dr. Weathers. <laughs> His official title here at Cal Southern is Curriculum Director. He brings with him more than 35 years of experience in educating graduate level clinicians. He was for me a prof former professor of clinical psychology at Pepperdine University. He's also taught graduate psychology courses at Loma Linda University, Pacifica Graduate Institute, Argosy University, and California State University, San Bernardino. In addition to having served as a founding clinical director of a locally, nationally recognized residential drug and alcohol treatment center for adults, Dr. Weathers has decades of professional experience in providing psychotherapy to clients presenting with a wide, wide range of clinical issues and concerns. He's a sought-after speaker and a very prolific writer. His current research area and focus is on reducing shame and stigma in addiction in recovery. Dr. Weathers' lifelong commitment to education inspires him to create and share success strategies for online higher education. And I do want to note that he will be speaking at the Lifestyle Convention in Las Vegas, October 7th on behavioral addictions. Thank you, and without further ado, I'll turn it over. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. In order for this to work, uh, what we want to do and present today, it must breathe. And we'll be talking a lot about breath today. Mm -hmm. In fact, let me begin with a poem um, in the spirit of. Uh, this is a poem by the uh, American poet Robert Bly, and it's called The Third Body. And I'll be riffing off of this throughout my portion of the, uh, of the presentation today. And so I'll, I'll be reciting it slowly so that it can um, hopefully land, and then we'll be amplifying different parts of it throughout the entire presentation. Uh, Robert Bly wrote this in a volume called Loving a Woman in Two Worlds. It was written to his wife about 30 years ago. And uh, I heard him recite this poem uh, at a conference years ago, and it's really... Uh, branded me. So here's the poem. <clears throat> a man and a woman sit near each other, and they do not long at this moment to be older or younger, nor born in any other nation or time or place. They are content to be where they are, talking or not talking. <laughs> Their breaths together feed someone whom we do not know. The man sees the way his fingers move. He sees her hands as she hands him a book. They obey a third body that they share in common. They've made a promise to love that body. Age may come, parting may come, death will come. A man and a woman sit near each other as they breathe, they feed someone we do not know, someone we know of, whom we have never seen. So what is this third body, this uh, between, that the poet describes? The ancient wisdom traditions called it the glutinum mundi, this is the Latin term for literally the glue of the world. The between. And that's what we're going to talk about and not talk about <laughs> for the next two hours. And we're really privileged to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> I have something here. A couple of things. <clears throat> Most of what Stephen and I are doing today, we've left open, so much of this he doesn't know what I'm going to do, and vice versa. <laughs> no, I, <can't. laughs> I was telling my partner Colleen last night, I, I'm really doing this uh, in the spirit of wanting to surprise you and her. <laughs> so, um, 30 years ago, I, I did my doctoral dissertation on mindfulness. It was really a dissertation on silence. This is it. 
And uh, it was one of the early uh, psychological studies of mindfulness meditation. And so this was, this was my work. And at my final orals, I actually wanted to put this in my dissertation, but it wasn't allowable for, for copyright reasons. At my final oral defense, I read this poem as we began the final oral defense, and I want to share it with you right now. It's by, it's called Windscript, it's by the French poet, um, still alive, Jean Joubert. He says, words are vulnerable. All can assail them. This marks our limits, guards us from an excess of pride. Then there are left only splinters of language, like voices far across the valley, and sometimes nothing. Sand, silence, calligraphy of the wind. I did feel like it was ironic to write a several hundred page dissertation on silence, and so I felt like I really needed to read that to start things off. Uh, and that as you said, Barbara, as fate would have it, uh, fate winds its way through all of, all of uh, our history together. It was 10 years later that I met Stephen and, uh, at, 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 uh, uh, at Pepperdine in terms of working on your dissertation. We worked together on this dissertation, the bulk of which was Steve's genius, and this is Steve's dissertation. And Steve's dissertation itself is also a deep meditation on silence, and particularly how absolutely crucial it is to our quality of life. So if you put these one on top of the other, we have two big fat dissertations on silence. Do you get the irony of that, you guys? <laughs> Uh, with that, may I introduce Dr. Stephen Beasley. <laughs> Is there anything more to say? <laughs> uh, I have to yeah. tell you, I have to tell you, we sent texts to each other this morning checking in and Steve sent his text to me with just an ellipsis mark. Da, da, da. That was his response. Because you know in literature three ellipses means nothing needs to be said. It's <laughs> taking the place of saying something as is. So that's all I had to say was three little dots. Um, well first, first um, hmm. let me say uh, a, a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Grimes because it was her idea yeah. uh, to put us up here and as part of the Master Lecture Series. So thank you so much for that, for giving us this forum. And yeah. of course to Dr. Ryan, who I greatly admire. Mm -hmm. um, she's a terrific uh, manager, but a better leader. And so mm -hmm. I really thank you for having us here today. Thanks, and Sarah. I want to um, offer a quote that I really like uh, a lot and it's followed me and I'm going to apply it right here right now, and that is by um, Arthur Schopenhauer that said, uh, talent hits a target that few can hit. Genius hits a target that few can see. <laughs> that, my friends, is Dr. Donald Hecht. Mm. He hit a target that none of us, now all of us, can see by mm. starting this university. Mm. But don't take my word for it. Go on YouTube, watch yeah. The founding of Cal Southern University, it's 11 minutes and 8 seconds of what I'd call pure practical genius. Mm -hmm. Do yourself a favor, if you've watched it, watch it again because that is a master at work synthesizing not only his life but his passion and something he's given to all of us. It's only 11 minutes and 8 seconds but it, will, it changed me for sure. So thank you to Dr. Donald Heck. Yes. Uh, he's an inspiration to all of us, uh, me included. Mm -hmm. So I, I have this blessing and curse of thinking about big ideas. I don't, you know, I'm not a very detailed person. I'm not a, much of an administrative person. There's people that do that beautifully. But I tend to think in big, broad brush strokes, which again is a curse and a blessing because when it's a broad brush stroke, you typically don't know what to do with it after you thought about it. But in this case, writing a dissertation to satisfy a requirement for my doctoral degree, it gave a perfect context to take these big sweeping brush strokes that I've been thinking about for years and still think about to this day and put them in a format that was not only um, 
advising to myself, but could be advising to the professional community. And that's what we're all in education for, is to lend to the professional community. Give our take, and maybe it's original, maybe it's not, but our view of the world, lend it to the larger view. And between us, we all speak to everyone together because we're all coming at it from different directions. Mm -hmm. And so I love the idea of thinking about things, <clears throat> the between, the between people, between things, and between ideas. And what's, what's most helpful to do when, when considering this, because the between has no shape to it. It's as vast as you want it to be, or it's as sometimes claustrophobic as you'd like it to be. The point is thinking about things in terms of how do things contrast with one another, and how do they complement one another. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge each of us, as I challenge myself, to think that things that complement one another are probably more different than alike testing our beliefs. And things that uh, maybe are more contrasting are more, maybe more alike than they are different. It's challenging what we think we know and exploring the between things, whether it's between you and I, you and I, we may seem completely different, we may seem completely alike, but after a little conversation, he and I be, may be much more alike than you and I. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us. That should be, in fact, that should be comforting because at the end of the day, we're all connected. So mm -hmm. it's a nice sentiment, but what do you do with all that except sit and be the tiger chasing its tail? And I had to deliver a dissertation and my dissertation chair was not buying into the idea of me turning in 250 blank pages of, <laughs> on silence and calling that my dissertation. <laughs> Those would be very difficult orals to defend, although I felt like I could. Um, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have my doctoral degree today if I would have tried that. So um, <laughs> format will out in that case. But nonetheless, I had somebody um, like Dr. Weathers to help me. I had one, one professor at Pepperdine say, I kind of floated my ideas, and it was the right thing for her to say. She said, you know you'll never finish this dissertation, right? You'll, you'll never be done. Because topics like you're taking on are never completed. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Bobby and said, do it anyway. <laughs> So, <laughs> so that was the right blend and balance of, mm. of format and, and encouragement. And I think that's what we do here at Cal mm. Southern. We like to keep people on track but encourage them to dream and think outside the box. So what do I do with these things? Um, I, I have this particular mm. interest in silence for one reason, and that is because I do not understand it, and I have no idea how to do it. But it's those topics in life that mystify you that you absolutely must study. You have to go after them. And so when I thought about silence, it scared me to death. Because I thought, I'm going to delve into something A, I know nothing about, B, I have no idea how to do, and C, the thought of being a yogi really doesn't appeal to me at all. <laughs> but again, I had a mentor in this case to say, no, 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 go in. It's okay. Go into that area no matter how frightened you are. And I think I confessed to him, I don't think I, I don't even know if I can do this. Mm -hmm. But he said, go. Mm -hmm. So I was dutiful at that moment and went anyway despite my fears. And so I started thinking about things in terms of relationships. And it did make it a lot easier. So I started to think of silence to, in, uh, in relationship to sound. I started thinking to words uh, that we use in relationship to pauses that we take. Or in my case, I would never take pauses. That's a problem. But looking at these relationships and looking at the counterparts of stillness, how to be still in mind because if you're still in body, that does not mean, and you know this, right? Mm -hmm. That you're not necessarily still in mind. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different thing. And then when is it proper to move? Because I've seen people not move mm -hmm. on anything and things just pass them by in life. So what of all these things? How do we, hindsight is great. You can always say, oops, I should have kept quiet when I spoke. Oh, I should have spoke when I kept quiet. The key to life is how do you know on the front end when to do these things? And I had no idea, and by the way, still really have no idea, on when to do what. So I had to delve a little bit further and think about them in a context, in, in a space and time, uh, not an Einsteinian, because who knows what he really thought of, but this idea of thinking about them in dimensions. So I said, okay, what about space and time? And then I was even in bigger categories than I was in silence and sound, and I was totally lost totally lost in thought. I knew I was somewhere, but there was not a light to guide me. So I thought, okay, keep it simple. Go to simplicity. 
So here's what I did, and it was a doorway into my thinking, as I'm sure I'm not saying anything you all haven't experienced. You know, when Alice in Wonderland sat in that gigantic room and she was hunched over and there's this little bitty door, she says, how do I get through that? Well, somehow she made it through the little door and it was through simplicity. So I started to think about, okay, just take some everyday practical thinking and I still have to remind myself. Okay, so space and time, big categories, huge, you know, E equals MC squared, too big to think about. So I taught, thought about the, the relationship between place and space. And a lot of times we collapse these uh, concepts. Let me give you an example. So this morning there were plenty of good parking places out front. And there were plenty of good parking spaces out front too. Okay, we're good, right? I can use either one interchangeably. But here's where the thinking comes in. If you think about, for instance, the opening line to Star Trek, the old um, show, they say space, the final frontier. You cannot say place, the final frontier. You have to think differently about things. Mm -hmm. There's an old show, uh, there, there's a show on PBS called This Old House. Um, it could have been called This Old Home. And you go, okay, I still like the show. But you can't say President Obama lives in the White Home. So it challenges your thinking to say there must be more than the material world, although the material world is very... So I, I use those mm -hmm. correlates to say, mm -hmm. how do we deal with silence? Because it is a state, but it's also an undetermined one. So then I took time real quick, and I said, okay, I've got to flesh out time. And you can say, um, you can tell somebody who calls your name and say, uh, just a minute, I'll be right there. Or you could say, just a moment, I'll be right there. And you don't lose meaning. But in moments of epiphany, you don't have aha minutes. <laughs> you have an aha moment. That's where it separates. And moment challenges you. Minute is just fine. Or if you're at a baseball stadium and they're, uh, they're honoring somebody who might have passed away, they never say, let's have a minute of silence. Because then you're looking at your watch saying, okay, a minute's almost up. You say a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about these large categories saying, I think I have to deal with space as undetermined and moments as undetermined. And then I was even more lost. So that's when I went to Bob and said, how do I do this? I, I think the thinking is sound, but I don't know how to get it into something that, is, that can be discussed. So here's where an excellent mentor comes in mm. and saves you from yourself. <laughs> thank you. Did I ever, I don't think I ever thanked him for that, by the way. I just said, oh yeah, I, I already knew that. You're welcome. I was a little bit younger then and, you know, I wasn't was so too. afraid of things. <laughs> so here's what Bob and I started talking about. And this, this is what a mentor does. A mentor doesn't tell you what to do. A mentor points in a direction and you go. Just go at that moment. So we started talking about, maybe we need to move into the world of art and artful pursuits. Maybe art has already dealt with this thing that I can't get my mind around. So Bob and I talked and of course Bob's a musician so he said well why don't you delve into music. I said well I'm not really a musician. He goes no, 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 no that's not essential. Delve into music. Mm -hmm. So I took his word on that. I said okay let me start reading. And then he also introduced me to Martin Buber. I'd mm -hmm. never heard of Buber before. I didn't know anything about the philosopher. And so he said, why don't you read a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. He didn't tell me what to do. He guided me in a direction and I dutifully went mm -hmm. because I trusted my mentor. Mm -hmm. So Bob gave me those two. And then I thought, okay, so how do we flesh this out? I'm in a psychology program, so maybe I need to go into that field too and look into how is silence in the space between dealt with in psychology. And then I went a little bit further and I thought, how is it dealt with in, in terms of color, in terms of artistry, in terms of painting? So Bob and I agreed that these were the four proofs that I would start now proving and fleshing out my theory that silence is therapeutic and that every art form, including psychotherapy, mm -hmm. must deal with silence. It must. A master therapist is not a master therapist until he or she can deal and contain and hold and learn to love silence. That's beautiful, Steve. So, since Bob was the one who pointed towards music, I want to have him start by fleshing that out of what I came, what I came to learn and what he already knew, thankfully. Um, and so I, uh, the kind of the heading of uh, the music section is called "The Rest Is Silence." 
two meaning, it's a double meaning there. The first meaning is in, in uh, musical notation, they, they're the rest. If you know a little bit about music, they use a rest to denote a silence along with the notes. So there's the rest and there's the notes. And that tells you when to not play and when to let the note resonate into the silence. But as an aside, it also happens to be the very last line that Hamlet utters before he dies. But that's a different lecture series, right? Um, uh, so, Bob, music. It's a little clicker. Thank you, thank you. Uh, wow, that's great, Stephen. Yeah. Mm. Before, before I talk about music, I want to talk a little bit more about our relationship. Mm. And um, the two are coextensive. It's hard to separate them out. Steve and I are now best of friends, and when we sit together, our conversations float in and out of everything, but they're, they're, they're uh, uh, seasoned with musical references all the way. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just all the time. Um, my first meeting of, of Stephen was, um, I was thinking about this morning, it was exactly 20 years ago. Um, uh, we met here in Orange County. As, as, as um, uh, the things lined up, I was invited to give a presentation <laughs> on um, the interface between spirituality and psychology uh, in, in Newport Beach, and um, Stephen introduced me that night, and I want to talk about my first meeting yeah, of yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you don't know that I'm going to say any of this, but there was, there was a way of being, and I want you to think about this for yourself, there was a way of being, or a way of breathing, or a way of holding space that Stephen is that was instantly recognizable to me, and I could not help but respond to it. Unforgettable. I remember as clear as a bell. I have the chills right now. I remember as clear as a bell the first time I met Stephen. Hmm. Can you remember one significant relationship in your life? Just, for, just take a moment. Hmm. Where you had the same experience, where there was some kind of distinctive presence that's irreducible, can't be reduced to just words. Think about that for just a second. And assuming that we've all been graced with at least one such experience, what is that? <laughs> what is that? And so I want to um, uh, uh, speak a little bit of, from a psychological perspective, and we'll be moving into music and art and uh, philosophy over the course of our conversation. Um, let's see here. Let me back up for just a second. Here we go. Uh, my, my favorite author in psychology in the last 30 years is Daniel Stern. He is a, a, a psychologist and a psychoanalyst, uh, is based out of Columbia University uh, mm -hmm. and also teaches at the University of Geneva. He has studied the interactions between infants and mothers more than anybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so most of his writing comes out of that experience, but he's branched out over the last few years. And so he'll talk about, he has, a, he has an entire book on this moment the experience of a moment. Um, uh, his most recent book is Forms of Vitality, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it has something to do with the space between and this experience that we have that I had with you, Stephen, mm -hmm. from the very first moment of meeting you. Mm -hmm. Psychology has a hard time uh, uh, writing or thinking into this, and you'll see this. Daniel Stern is uh, absolutely an original thinker, so I'd love to read anything that he writes. He could write about dirt, and I want to read what he <laughs> writes about because it has a different take on everything. And the first thing that he does in this book is he makes a distinction between categorical and vitality affects. Translate into English, Bob. Categorical affects or, or emotions are what psychology has spent so much time studying. So emotions like joy and sadness and anger, psychology has a lot to say about that and studying it right down to a biological level. But that isn't Daniel Stern's primary interest. His interest is in vitality affects. Another term he uses for that is this one, activation contours. And what he means by that is that there are these individual categories of emotion that we have, but there's the whole tone, there's the whole uh, contour of emotional life that each one of us emits, uh, expresses, and lives, inhabits, that's what he's interested in, and he calls those forms of vitality. That's what I responded to with you, Stephen, the very hmm. first time I met you. Hmm. I didn't have any words for it, and nor do we need to have words for this. We all know this experience. You resonate. There's like a harmonic resonance with another individual. You experience that the first time uh -huh. you meet them. I had that with Carol Ryan the first time I met you. I was in a car driving up in Malibu. We were on the phone. Unforgettable conversation. It was immediately present, Carol. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's only ever been there. It's like, what is that? <laughs> it's not reducible to psychology, but I love it that you have a psychologist who, for the cover of his book, has a 
a dancer who wants to talk about forms of vitality. Two years ago, I had an opportunity to teach a class here locally at another sister university. It was a course on addiction and recovery. That's been my specialization for the last few years. And I tried an experiment. At that time, Colleen and I lived an hour north of the university. And one evening, uh, driving to class, it was about four weeks into an eight-week uh, semester. Uh, I drove in the car, very slow traffic, driving down the 405, busiest freeway in the world, and I had the list of the students in my class sitting on the seat next to me. There were about 20 students in this class. So we'd had about four weeks together, and uh, I tried an experiment. It actually came up spontaneously like most good experiments do. I read each student's name and drove for several minutes just feeling into my experience of that student's mm. activation contour or vitality affect or whatever you want to call it. And what was remarkable to me is that I had only known these students for a handful of hours. Each one of them carved a special niche in my psyche. It was absolutely identifiable, absolutely uh, unique. It, their signature was inside of me. I was really pleased by that. It was in the car, by the way, it was while I was reading this book. That's what spurred the, the little experiment in the car. So I got to class that night and I shared um, what I had done. I didn't share the specifics. It wouldn't have felt fair to go around the room and do that. But what I did do is I shared the experience and I was really in one of these aha moments. That's amazing that we touch each other that way. And then I asked the students to look at one another and tell me if that wasn't the case for them too. Hmm. And they all agreed it was, it's, it's the thing that we don't talk about. It's the glutinum mundi. It's the connection in between our individual personalities that's kind of a constant hum. And very rarely do we stop the other conversation and so just to notice, what is this? Uh, it brings me back to, uh, excuse me, it brings me back to the poem I just shared a minute ago, Robert Bly's poem, specifically where he says, talking or not talking. Their breaths together feed someone we do not know. Someone we know of. We know of, but we've never seen it. You can't grab a hold of this. We all know it. And what Stephen uh, uh, made clear in your dissertation in our wish today is how absolutely essential, how absolutely critical this unknown, unseen, totally known uh, quality or commodity mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And undetermined, by the way. And determined by you and I, by yes. you and I, by yes. you and I, yes. and determined very differently. Yes, yeah, absolutely in contextual. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this just this week. After 16 years, Stephen and I didn't have any contact for 16 years. After 16 years, here we still are. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like your fourth grade teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> and only ever have been the yeah. since when I met Stephen. I asked for you to reference your own experience, and you'll find your own language for this. Whatever I experienced with Stephen, that's all that there ever was between us. And my not seeing you for 16 years is immaterial. I think it's because we didn't share minutes. What we shared was moments. Mm -hmm. And that was the defining mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I set plenty of minutes listening to him in class. Mm -hmm. Fairly interesting. But it was the moments that we shared... <laughs> And especially the moments where we were both totally confused about where do we go next related to the piece of work we were doing yeah. that I think created the moments mm. that are unforgettable, by the way. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Part of what we talk a lot about here, I talk with Dr. Grimes and Dr. Ryan and others in our university, is how do we um, uh, update that experience and convey that in an online medium. I think mm -hmm. it's absolutely possible, and that's what we're working on, and that's what makes this conversation, I think, really uh, current, mm -hmm. really contemporary. <laughs> let me let me shift in. Do you invite me to talk a little bit about music? Are we yep. good with that? Yep. Are we good with that? Okay. Are we good with that? <laughs> <laughs> this is Jan Christensen. Uh, he's been called the most influential European jazz drummer of the last 50 years. In fact, he's universally acclaimed as that. I believe I have every single recording that Jan Christensen ever made which is a lot. I love him. <laughs> Five years ago, uh, in May of 2009, Dr. Grimes, our dean in psychology, and I had the incredible blessing opportunity to travel to Oslo, Norway, 
um, uh, the, the purpose of the, of the travels were to go to the, it was the uh, European Distance Learning Association that met and we were there to convey, uh, bring good tidings from America and we formed links there that have continued to the present. That was the formal reason for our being there. But there was an informal reason for my being there. <laughs> I spent the evening of May 15th, 2009 with Jan Christensen. I called him up when we got to Oslo. He lives in Oslo. In fact, the recording studio in which he's recorded most of his music over the last 15 years, uh, Rainbow Studio, is in, is in Oslo. I initially intended to go to the studio, but I finally was able to make contact with uh, Jan. He prefers to be called Jan. He came to the, this hotel. The Grand Hotel is the oldest hotel in Oslo. It, it's well named. And we sat there right down here in the restaurant and spoke for three hours about rhythm, the beat. He calls it the beat. And I want to share with you a couple of nuggets. I actually, after we talked for several hours, immediately said goodbye to him, immediately sat down and wrote out a verbatim transcript of our entire conversation. I was reading a book on the moment by Daniel Stern and it's been inside those notes, which are pages and pages of notes, have been inside that I've left them inside there and that they're upstairs, those, those, uh, those transcribed notes of that conversation. So a couple of gems from the conversation with Joan Christensen. He said to me, he said, Bob, if I were to go in a into a jazz club here in Oslo, let's say on Saturday night at 8 p.m. and strike the cymbal once, this is the kind of stuff I love. <laughs> And we're to come back exactly one week later, next Saturday at 8 p.m., and strike the cymbal a second time. Even though most people wouldn't realize it, that would be a beat. <laughs> so I have a story to tell you. Exactly 50 years ago, in September of 1964, just about the time that Jon Christensen began his professional recording career, little Bobby Weathers was a nine-year-old boy, entered into the, uh, the drumming program at Vandalia Elementary School in Porterville, California, Central California. I'd been playing piano since almost birth, but I really wanted to play drums. I asked to play drums and began studying drumming exactly 50 years ago this month. For the first five years that I drummed, all we did was practice rudiments, paradiddles. We practiced, mm -hmm. that's all I did was practice the, it's like practicing the alphabet of drumming. And then by the time I started high school, I knew how to drum with that in my background. So those first five years, and I have to tell you for any nine, 10, 11 year old boy or girl, that's dreadfully boring. It, it was incredible, it just took absolute gumption to go through those exercises, it was night after night. My teacher was Mr. Glass and he had the grace in, in those first few weeks of our studying drumming to take us next door to Pioneer Junior High School. We went in the band room and for the first time I got to see a drum set. There was a drum set right before us, you know, the whole drum set. <coughs> and he looked at each of, it was all boys in this class, he looked at each of the boys and said, you can go up and hit one part of this drum set. And so I think I was last in line, so each boy got up there, got a stick, and most of them bashed cymbals. Yeah! But I had my eye on something else. I had my eye on the hi-hat. I'd never seen a hi-hat before. A hi-hat has two inverted cymbals with a foot pedal that connects them, and I knew what I wanted. And so when he handed me the stick, I said, I don't want that. And so I went up and I sat down, and I played the hi-hat. Well, I think it's appropriate in the spirit of Jan Christensen that 50 years later, it's been exactly 50 years since I played my first hi-hat note, that I finished that beat with a second note. Okay, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> <laughs> How was it? <laughs> Complete. <laughs> <laughs> 
that feels really good. That's, that's a dedication to Mr. Glass. So, hmm. as odd as this sounds, whether it's John Christensen's comment or a 50-year gap between beats, it's a way to begin to understand rhythm in our life, and that that really is a 50-year beat that's been waiting until today to be played. Hmm. Hmm. Let me say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. John Christensen on the beat. I talked about Daniel Stern and forms of vitality. Um, when I was talking with John Christensen, he said that each drummer has his or her own signature, just like what we were talking about in terms of this relationship, this connection. And what Jon told me is he said, you could, you could play recordings of 10 different drummers. You could play recordings of 100 different drummers. And I could tell you who they are, not by how they hit the cymbals, but how they hold space between the notes. I've never forgotten that. Mm. I could tell you exactly who they are by their relationship to silence. Mm. Hmm. This is Bob and Jan at the end of the conversation. He actually stood up and said, let's have somebody take our picture. <laughs> this is in the Grand Hotel of Oslo. I have to tell you guys this story. Jan said at the end of the conversation, we laughed together. We had a lot of laughing. In fact, in the conversation, at one point, he picked up his napkin and threw it at me. There was a lot of teasing. It was, it was, we don't, it's like you and I, Stephen. Hmm. It's like with Jan, we'd always, we'd always uh, known each other. It's no accident that I have everything he recorded because his conception of rhythm is exactly my own. It's that resonant with it. It's like he drums the way that, that I would aspire to drum. I feel it this way. Hmm. And he saw that. In fact, he said to me, he says, Bob, I honestly think that you know my music and my drumming better than I do. <laughs> I think that's when he threw the napkin at me. <laughs> as, as, with, as with Jan Christensen, uh, so with Stephen, is that whatever this connection is, is, is part of what we're talking about today. Um, it makes me think of the word interest. And if we look at the Latin etymology of the word interest, interest is one, I, my sixth grade teacher, Miss Todd, I remember said to our class, don't use the word interesting in your sentences, huh. because it's not. Huh. <laughs> she was very finicky about these things. But the word interest could be redeemed. If you break down interest into its two roots, it's literally inter between and essay, which is the root of essence. It's between essences. And so this that I've experienced with Jan my entire adult life, this that I've experienced with Stephen across all these years, hosted primarily by silence, is inter -essay. I'm very interested in you, Stephen. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which means he's not because he used the word interested, right? <laughs> <laughs> Miss you Todd. All, everybody heard that just now but him. <laughs> Miss Todd is having a word with me from heaven yes, right yes, now. Yes, <laughs> she's very finicky that way. <laughs> My partner Colleen has a favorite uh, phrase that's been attributed to Carl Jung where he says, who we are happens to us. Who we are happens to us. Lately I've been thinking about it a little bit different. I've been thinking who we aren't, that is our relationship to space and silence, that happens to us all as well. Who I am not happens to me. If I can make it a little bit less esoteric, this is one of my favorite saxophonists. This is the great jazz saxophonist, Charlie Parker. His spirit is conveyed fully in that photograph right there. He's the founder of what's called uh, modern jazz or bebop. Oh. And really one of the giants. He's like, uh, well, yeah. To what, to what Jimi Hendrix is to rock and roll guitar, Charlie Parker is to uh, jazz saxophone. And I, I love what Charlie Parker says about this same sentiment. He says, if you don't live it, your horn won't play it. Huh. If you don't live it, your horn won't play it. Huh. I just had the opportunity this last weekend to spend four days at a conference in um, um, the south of Utah. The conference was on, on integral recovery. Um, integral recovery is uh, an approach to working with addiction recovery that really intends to span body, mind, and spirit in a highly articulate fashion. And there were people from all over the world at this conference. Um, 
what I want to mention is something, the mind, body, and spirit, what I want to mention is how the, the body and the spirit were attended to in this conference as well as the mind. There was a lot of very technical talking going on, theorizing, etc. in the conference. But what stays with me is how attention was given to our bodies and our spirits by virtue of every morning we would get up, the entire group, and would gather in a meditation hall and spend between a half hour and an hour in silence together just holding space, hmm. meditating, at the end of which each individual had a moment to share what, what their experience was in the meditation. Hmm. As, as in Robert Bly's poem, we breathe together. And so then anything that was said out of the mind later through the day was conditioned by our having established a foundation in silence. I love that. Let's speak, first of all, out of a place of peacefulness, out of a place of centeredness, out of a place of silence. Let the words I speak find their origin in respect for silence. I love the fact that in, in the uh, ancient b uh, biblical traditions, both the Hebrew tradition as well as the Christian tradition, that the word for breath is translated as spirit. In the Hebrew Bible, ruach is translated as spirit. Hmm. Breath equals spirit in the ancient Hebrew, and the language of the, New, the Christian New Testament is Koine Greek, ancient Greek, and the term for spirit uh, in the New Testament is pneuma, as in pneumatic, and pneuma equals spirit. Ruach, spirit, breath, um, they all mean the same thing. Let me make a little plug here for our master lecture series. If you're interested, uh, if you're interested in uh, what uh, addiction recovery treatment might look like from a perspective that embraces body, mind, and spirit in the way that we're talking about it. Our very next master lecture will be, uh, be, will be led by John Dupuy, who's the author of this textbook, Integral Recovery. He's the founder of Integral Recovery. Uh, this book, by the way, was selected in 2013 as the number one book in the United States on addiction recovery. It's a really cutting edge, integrating multiple disciplines into one approach. Oh. Um, and I, I think I also want, want to mention, I know that many in that community that were there this weekend are online right now, so thank you all for joining us, <laughs> okay? Hmm. Stephen, you wanted to say a word or two about color. Uh, yeah, and make a comment on, because again, I haven't seen anything that Bob was going to do, so I'm hearing it for the first time just like you. And, you know, none of this can be reduced down to a single thought or a single mm. sentence because it's so rich. But I don't know what came to mind for you as you were listening, but what came to mind for me is what... Um, I consider a brilliant line, and it was spoken by Kanye West, saying, everything I'm not made me everything I am. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. And, you know, everything I'm not can be, um, can be restored within a, re a good relationship. And that would make me everything I am. So, um, kudos to Kanye, right? Right. Um, <laughs> um, so I know nothing about color. I'm not an artist. I can't paint. I, I don't know anything about color. But I'm saying, okay, but my topic is not color. It's relationships. And every art form must deal with relationships of rests to notes, of, uh, of in architecture, you know, there's a famous saying that architecture is frozen music. Um, there must be a relationship to silence and that idea of relationship, uh, uh, relationships between things. Every artist, no matter what their medium, must deal with this to become a master. So I thought, well, I don't need to master color. I just need to understand relationships between color. And then that it can be analogous back to, because I, did, I was writing a doctoral dissertation on the therapeutic relationship. So everything had to come back in at that point to clinical psychology, but my thinking could leave clinical psychology, traverse some landscapes that I know nothing about, and then import things back in. Mm -hmm. And then it would all make sense. So I know nothing about color except to say I started reading, and those of you who are either doing or have done major projects, whether it's dissertations or pro doctoral papers or writing a book, you know that you read a thousand things to get to two things. And eight, 998 of them do not go in your bibliography, but you still read them. Only two of those. So it's a daunting task, and you all know it if you have or are in the middle of embarking on a major project. But I read a lot about color, and these two things came to the fore for me that, again, lets me understand how the world works, how relationships work, 
and how silence in the space between works. So I just, I ran across this additive mixture of colors theory. I thought, huh, okay, what of that? And it's the idea that when you put two colors next to each other, and, and unlike blending colors, when you pour yellow and red together, what do you get? And you get this new color. Additive mixture colors says it's the sharing of a color's light. Meaning, the colors do not lose their form in and of themselves. They share light. Mm. Because at the edge of every color, probably like at the edge of every person, there's this aura. There's this vibrating effect. I can feel between you and I the vibrations coming off you. I can't name those. I don't know what they are. But I can feel a sense. And you may call that spirit. You could call that soul. But there's a sense that all people have auras around them that we emanate. And they could be positive or negative, by the way. But so colors do the same. So in this additive mixture of colors, I thought, okay, good. There's a, there's a proper analogy for me to think about concrete things in an abstract way. So I said, okay, so what are the two uh, kind of laws of the additive mixture of colors? And uh, you see on here, rather I, I can't do your left, my right, here, <laughs> that this is a, a depiction of a color wheel. And it says that uh, complementary colors or colors that are like one another produce a third color that third area that Robert Bly was talking about, yeah. that third area that exists between you and I, that mm. third area mm. that is undetermined, we determine it. Not I don't, mm. you don't. We determine what color that third <clears throat> area is. So in the case of red and green, our third area is yellow. I'm not yellow, you're not yellow, but we're yellow. How do we negotiate the yellow? And that may take me out of my comfort zone because I'm green. Okay, so how do I deal with yellow? means I got to meet you in your red in order to understand the yellow. Now, that's all good and fine. Um, another side to this, that's complementary. What's more complex is contrasting colors. And contrasting, if you and I don't feel like we're anything alike, there's much more space to negotiate, or maybe not. We may be more alike than we really believe. But in the additive mixture of colors, it says two colors that are contrasting of one another, in this case, magenta and green, create a white space. So the lesson I got from that is, in the white space, everything is possible. Anything is possible. That's where creativity arises. Out of that third area, creativity grows. Because we must negotiate the space between us. It's not my space. It's not your space. I'm not even sure it's our space. It's just there. So how do we do that? Whether it's a therapeutic relationship that has certain parameters to it, but still there's a space between therapist and client, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's friend and friend, we must negotiate that third space. So I asked, so how do colors do that? They, they got to do that too. And so by the additive mixture of colors, I decided that um, complementary colors create a third color. Contrasting colors create a white space that must be dealt with. Mm -hmm. So you and I, to have a relationship, must deal with the third. If we don't, I will dominate you, you will dominate me, or we will leave that space undetermined and we'll have nothing. Mm -hmm. And I can't prove that because I can't see it. I can't see the space between you and I, but I can feel it because I can feel your aura. And it's natural in color theory that colors also vibrate. They have wavelengths. That's all science stuff that's far beyond me. But the fact that colors are about wavelengths and they vibrate says that there must be something coming off that color that is felt by the color next to it. So again, that's all great theory, but I'm lost again. What do I do with all that? How do I translate that? So it just so happens as I was reading this, I, I, uh, I went to see a, a musical production of what, I'm not a big musicals fan, but what is uh, my favorite musical and really was a transformative artistic experience um, was Stephen Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George. Mm -hmm. um, I was blown away, not because the music was beautiful, he's a master, but because I didn't know anything about George Surratt. And mm -hmm. this musical addresses George Surratt and his... Uh, approach to his art called pointillism and really connecting the dots. And that's kind of what we're doing with each other as we try to understand each other. We're trying to connect the dots. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? Who, what is that? What, if I have a glass and a fork, what's the connection between those? Making connections. And Surat 
took this additive mixture of lights and said that I don't need to fill in every color. I, you will, your eye will fill in the color. You will decide what that color is. So as he came up with this theory that was scientific in nature, and it was almost creating, each painting was almost creating a universe of tiny dots that had a connectivity to it, he expressed that specifically in his art and did what other artists do uh, less intentionally, and that is they blend color, a greenish yellow. You see a picture of a meadow and you say, well, there's kind of a, what color was that? Well, it's kind of a greenish yellow that went over into the pond that was kind of a blue. There's this blending of and connection. Mm -hmm. But Surat, for me, really made it explicit that the space between the dots had to be determined by each one of the dots. And in each painting, he would create a tiny little universe unto itself mm -hmm. that would create a picture. And I don't think it's by mistake, it's probably by zeitgeist, that Seurat was working about the same time as Gestalt psychologists, yeah. who said, things complete each other. You know, all those laws of Gestalt psychology say the same thing that he was trying to say. There's a sense of, of, of completion, even if there's a space between them. They do make sense together. So I said, okay, so that's a pro going into the art, painting, whatever you want to say, the use of color in the world um, certainly has a relevance back into the relationship between you and I. But that's not human, that's inanimate. So this is only a space between things, colors. So I said, okay, got to get back into people because I'm a <laughs> budding clinical psychologist and if this doesn't translate, then it's just a bunch of mishigas that don't, doesn't have to do with anything. So I said, okay, okay, so where does this go? As I said, you read about a thousand things as you're doing a research project, about three make their way into what you're actually studying. Um, and I read this article, um, and it's a, I think it's four pages, and I read reams of stuff, books, but I came across this four page article that not only galvanized my thinking in my project, but also changed the way I thought about everything in the mm. world. And it was this four-page article by a psychoanalytic pediatrician who dealt with the caregiver in, uh, infant, um, who, by the way, was very influenced later by Daniel Stern, mm -hmm. um, called Donald Winnicott. Mm -hmm. And just the title alone, I didn't even need to read the article. I just, it just, there, it was an aha minute, right? You don't have those. You have aha moments, but. Um, the capacity to be alone. Because the idea is, um, if you're, a if you're a green or a red, you are alone. But when we blend those colors, you're not alone any longer. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of connection, a sense of oneness between us all, especially when we, when we bring visible those connections that are otherwise invisible. We make those alive. So I was reading this article, and I, it was four pages, but I think I read it 30 times, so that's almost like reading a book. Mm -hmm. um, understanding that he says the space between in this case, the mother or the caregiver, and the child is vital. The space between them. Um, and it's the idea of the, um, the capacity to be alone is the child to be alone or the infant to be alone in the presence of the mother. Because mm -hmm. you see what happens in studies when uh, infants are alone, like without anybody around, and you see some of the war um, you know, infants that are taken into orphanages or yeah. care during war that have a failure to thrive because there's no one to be alone with. They are alone. So the opposite of that is the idea that the infant <coughs> grows and learns to play and thrives and learns to be alone in the presence of the mother. So not alone. No, no, no. Alone. <laughs> So what is it? What is it? So Winnicott goes on to talk about that that is the first space in infants, um, in infants being, it's the first space they learn to play in. Not with the mother out of the room, but with the mother in the room and giving the infant proper space to play. Mm -hmm. The infant can turn back around and check back in. There you are. Okay, but I'm going to go back. And of course you can understand the implications if the mother moves in too close and plays for the child, or the mother leaves the room, and the child is truly left alone. Which makes that spacing between the caregiver and the infant everything. And you can infer for yourself the 
intended or unintended mistakes that a caregiver gives when they move in too close to a child's play space or into that third or stays too far back. It's a spacing issue. That's all it really is. Mm -hmm. And that is the space where the infant develops. I thought, okay, good. Because that's the first relationship that we have. And that must inform the rest of the relationships our whole life. The space between, in this case, the mother and the infant, where the infant can feel into that space and the mother leaves it open and undetermined for that infant then to grow, to play, to experiment, to get that first sense of self. So a little four page journal article was that little doorway that Alice went through and opened my thinking to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And at that moment when I read that article, which is about halfway into my dissertation research, I think, I got it. Well, he got it. And I just happened to get it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even know where I found that. I think I found it at UCI buried somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in the stacks. And we don't do that anymore, luckily. But I was roaming mm -hmm. through these aisles and it was almost like an archaeological dig. There it is. There it is, right there. And it informed everything I've done, did to f complete my dissertation, mm -hmm. and it informed everything I've done mm -hmm. since almost lock, stock, and barrel because of one thing. Because Winnicott was saying, and there's, there's the mother giving mm -hmm. the baby a proper space to play, yeah. okay? Yeah. Without intrusion, but without desertion either. It's that which makes motherhood or caregiving riskiest business on earth. Um, but what galvanized for me is this tension in this statement that I'm about to show you that you've seen and that is we're alone together and that shouldn't make any sense that says wait a minute that's an oxymoron don't know that's you got to separate those words and make them different because if you're alone you can't be together and I know you can precisely mm -hmm. and whether it be a therapist and client husband and wife friend and friend mm -hmm. two colleagues working together as soon as we can grasp the concept that we're alone together, somehow I think we got it. There's a lot to do after that. But if we can grasp this, in my mind, and resolve that tension between what seem to be two very opposite words, well now we've really got something. And now we know what the space between is about, is that we spend time alone together. <sighs> <laughs> Bob introduced me to Martin Buber. I had no idea who he was. I think he even handed me the I Thou book and said, go read this, and I dutifully went off. But I said, okay, the infant caregiver relationship must go into mature adult relationships too. We can't leave it there because we all grow up. And that's where I was able to, through Bob's help as a mentor, create that bridge between the first relationship and every relationship, especially adult relationships after that. And Martin Buber did a terrific job with understanding mm -hmm. and talking about that silence in the space between. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's beautiful. I'm reading right now a biography of the uh, British musician and producer Brian Eno. <clears throat> and Brian Eno, uh, uh, he just, in fact, just produced the latest U2 album, talks about how in his production technique that he never, um, I saw him lecture a number of years ago at UCL and he said, there's, there's no wasted motion. When, when, when somebody lays down what looks like a mistake in the recording process, he leaves it in there. He'll find some way to use it mm. creatively. And uh, why that comes up for me right now is how incredibly creative you are, Stephen Beasley. <laughs> Holy moly. Trouble. <laughs> and that there's no wasted motion. So you go to see a Stephen Sondheim musical and that gets woven in. You read this little four-page piece by Winnicott, that gets woven in and so on it goes. It's really extraordinary. There's uh, one of my favorite authors in the psychology of creativity is a psychiatrist at Harvard, Albert Rothenberg. And he's, he's coined uh, a, a phrase that he said, is in common across all creativity and it's just two words he calls it homo spatial process and the idea with that is that where you bring in two different entities into the same space that no one ever did before and the third that's created the third that's created that's the creative that's the creative product hmm. whether it's scientific creativity hmm. artistic creativity or whatever and this is this is example par excellence the way that you're bringing this together wow Wow. <laughs> so let's go back to the third body, and I will talk about Martin Buber in just a moment. What is it, back to that first poem, what is it to obey a third body that we all have in common? What, how do we do that? How do we do that? 
Martin Buber uh, is a Jewish uh, philosopher and theologian, um, extremely influential in the 20th century. In fact, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. His, his work, how rare is it that an intellectual, their work is so powerful that it gets nominated for a Peace Prize. Um, uh, and he made, he, he made his name, there's so much you could read about Martin Buber, it's just a wonderful literature. He has, for example, volumes that I just love of tales of the Hasidim, the Hasidic uh, traditions uh, uh, from Judaism in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, that there are these folk tales that are so incredibly mm -hmm. inspiring. They read like biblical parables. Um, but his, his primary uh, kind of tour de force is this book, uh, I and Thou. And in this book he makes a distinction between two different kinds of relationship. And I thou relationship and an I it relationship. In a nutshell, an I thou relationship is where I look at you and interact with you as if you're the divine. I interact with you as if you're a thou. And we all know what that feels like to have somebody look at us, listen to us, interact with us with that spirit, that generosity. Buber contrasts this with what he calls an I it relationship and that's where I treat you as an object. I use you. Uh, you're just a material uh, 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 stepping stone to whatever my goals are. And it's devoid then of caring connection. If I thou involves deep caring connection, I it involves a non-caring connection. Oh. And once, once you uh, get this, by the way, I recommend this book. It's very readable. Once you get this, and as we begin to internalize this, this affects not only our human relationships, but our relationships with animals and inanimate objects. And I want to tell you two recent examples of how this can go. I told you about being in Utah for the weekend for a conference, the Integral Recovery Conference. John and Pam Dupuy, who hosted the conference, John's the author of Integral Recovery, they have a uh, they have a how should I call it? a canine friend, <laughs> Lucy. Lucy is half black Labrador and half pit bull. She is this beautiful specimen of a being, and she knows about the third body. <laughs> All weekend long throughout our meetings, high-minded this and that about integral recovery, Lucy wandered in and out and engaged with each person. Uh, however many times she would come up and be right next to me and I would pet her. There's a way of engaging and I think that in many ways our animal friends are more aware of this third body. They get it, as I think infants do, than we grown-ups with all of our maturity and so on. So there's an example of an I-thou relationship uh, with Lucy. Another example would be, um, as it turns out at this conference, several of us were musicians. They, uh, the, uh, uh, Heidi, who was involved in uh, getting the conference together, actually ordered drums for me. So when I got there, there was a drum set for me there on the premises. Um, John is an incredible blues guitarist, and Guy Duplessis uh, from South Africa uh, uh, brought a bass. And so we had a, we had a, a rock and roll trio there. We played blues uh, throughout the, the, in the evenings to kind of unwind. Well, it was Monday morning, and we're all getting ready to go back to Salt Lake City to fly out, and Guy gets up in the morning and says, no, we have to play Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix just one more time. <laughs> so the three of us got together. That's I Thou relationship to not only one another as musicians, but even to the songs and to the instruments. There's a way that the way that we treat our instruments, the way that we treat our animals, is the way that we treat one another. There's no difference. Hmm. I hmm. Thou across the board. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, the best-selling uh, a spiritual writer of the last 20 years is Eckhart Tolle. He originated in Germany, uh, was educated in Cambridge and England, and now lives, has lived for years in Vancouver. And he's got a whole series of books. You might have recognized one of his books, The Power of Now, which is a bestseller for years and so on. Um, he has a book called Stillness Speaks. And I think the title of the book says it all. Stillness Speaks. And there's a quote that I want to share with you out of this book that I think captures the heart of what it is to obey the third body. Eckhart Tolle says, In the space of conscious presence that arises as you listen, in the space of conscious presence as opposed to unconscious absence, as we really listen to one another, the other person is no longer other. Huh. That really conveys it right there. It's where you're no longer other to me. It's where those two colors are up against each other. Neither one is other to the other. <laughs> there is no other. <laughs> but what then is, uh, what is it to listen or to be present consciously? What is that? 
I've been reading a book in the last several uh, months by the preeminent experimental classical composer of the 20th century. Most of you won't know his name, but he's well known in classical music and contemporary music. His name is John Cage. And as it turns out, he just published the 50th anniversary edition of this book. It's an entire book on silence. And I want to share with you <clears throat> his answer to the question of what is it to be consciously present? What is it to really listen? John Cage has a piece of music that's infamous. It was composed in the middle part of last century, the last century. And the piece of music is simply called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. You might have a sense of where this is going. <laughs> so he has an orchestra up on stage and a score up here for the conductor and the orchestra. The conductor lifts his baton and the orchestra engages in four minutes and 33 seconds of one rest. It's complete silence. <clears throat> now you can imagine the furor in the music listening community because certainly he's got to be sarcastic. There's, there's no music. <laughs> But there's his point, and stick with me, in the spirit of all that we've been talking yeah. about, and he articulates it in this book. He articulates in this book is that his idea there is that if you really pay attention for those four minutes and 33 seconds, is it really silent? There may, be, there may be no violin or no drumming going on, but the idea there is if we just sit together as a collectivity and listen for four minutes and 33 seconds, how often do we do, do, we do that? What do we hear? We could do it right now. We're not going to. All the ambient noises that are going on. And if you listen closely enough, I, I practice a meditation in the morning where one of the things I do is I locate my heartbeat just sitting quietly. I did this morning and I couldn't locate it. Sometimes it's so quiet. But other times I can. I can just sit there and I can feel my heart beating in my chest. I didn't realize that was even possible. It was Richard Davidson uh, at University of Wisconsin that suggested this idea to me in front of mindfulness meditation. The fact is, is that each one of us has a heart beating right now. How often are we conscious of it? This is what John Cage was after, was that level of conscious presence where I notice something as subtle as my heartbeat or your breath. Let me, yes. I could only imagine that um, that night when he played that piece, there was a line in front of the box office of people who wanted their money back. <laughs> exactly. And then immediately bought tickets for the next night. So, um, you know, as I read about that piece too, uh, as calming as it was for some in that audience, <laughs> there were some people that were enraged. And they weren't enraged at John Cage, but the audacity for him to make them think about what they were thinking about. Because in that white space, mm. all things rise. Mm. And all things mm. ain't all great things. Mm. So I, I guess I want to say that in the, in the silence, we're talking about it as a very growth and transformative experience. But be very careful. That's a tricky place to be because some stuff comes up that you know, words continue to tamp down. I don't know why I need to do that PSA for that, but, you know, silence is everything, and it can be um, a difficult space to negotiate. It's good that you named that. I just had a conversation at the front desk yesterday with Rachel, our receptionist, and we were talking about our presentation to come. She was talking about how it is in a central relationship in her life that silence is a pretty uh, rare commodity. And who of us can't relate to that? And, and the, the distinction I shared with her is directly quoted from Stephen Beasley's dissertation. I says, you know, there's a distinction, Rachel, between two different kinds of silence, and you just touched on one of them. There is the silence that stirs us up. There's the silence that creates anxiety, and who of us doesn't know that? Mm. You see, like silence pushed one second too long is now moving into discomfort or anxiety, unrest or distress. And I said, there's a distinction, Rachel, between that silence on the one hand and another kind of silence that in Steve's words, settles, settles. And who of us doesn't know that? Rachel's gone through some experiences in the last couple of months, and I looked at her and I said, think about what, have happened, what would have happened, Rachel, if when I was walking in in the morning or leaving in the afternoon, in the evening, if I had stopped and I started lecturing you about what you were telling me, these events in your life. No, we sat quietly together, and that's the silence that was necessary. That's what was huh. called for. 
That's the silence that settles. And so there really are these two different relationships. And I'm not sure which John Cage was intending, <laughs> but I have a surprise for Steve, and I want to tell you this, is that his idea is that silence or seeming emptiness is actually full. Is four minutes and 33 seconds properly kind of apprehended is absolutely full and overflowing. And I find it uh, amazing to me that I have not had any contact with Stephen in 16 years, and there's all this fullness that's you know a little bit of this. There's all this fullness of our relationship those 16 years ago that's continued so much so that um, just a few months ago, I can't remember, Carol, you were there. I walked into one of our all staff meetings and Don Hext, our, our uh, founder and owner, Carol, Carol Ryan, our president, stood there and there was another man that was in my periphery because the two of you I know and love and I didn't any attention and uh, Don Hex said to me Bob do you know this man and I looked up and I looked at him and I went Stephen Beasley and I went up and I threw my arms around you and I said to Don and Carol came up so I said I love this man <laughs> that's 16 years later that's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence it's absolutely <laughs> yeah. full and in that spirit I want to share with you the 50th anniversary version of this book that you used in your dissertation, but now it's in its 50th anniversary version. This is for you, Stephen. Oh, thank <laughs> Silence. you. Silence. Thank you. May, may it continue. <laughs> okay, thank you. And you know, there's not a word on any one of these pages. So he, got, he got away with it, I didn't. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, I, that, I, I read about um, his experiment of four minutes and 33 seconds, and I thought, you know, um, he could have easily joined Joan of Arc. Um, with that, with that experiment, and nearly but he did. lived to tell. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked about um, moving into uh, discussing maybe solitude and isolation. I'm totally free to go with the flow here. I've got some slides or not. Yeah. What, what do you want to do? I just want to say a word about that yeah. because, again, these simple concepts, and you know, like we were talking about space and time, sometimes we collapse them into meaning the same thing. I, I also thought long and hard about the two uh, silent states of uh, solitude and isolation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we use those words interchangeably. We can say, well, I was in an isolation isolated forest, you know, or I was in a forest where I felt solitude. Mm. But then I started thinking about those terms in depth, and I thought, what's the difference between, there's a relationship, but what's the, what's the contrast between si uh, isolation and solitude? And I, I don't know where it came to me, probably through a series of readings, but the difference is this, and I think this is important, especially if you, as you talk about, you know, various silent states. Solitude, even if you're alone, you feel part of something. Mm -hmm. In solitude, I feel connected to nature. I feel a part of nature. I feel solitude with you because I feel connected to you. Mm -hmm. You always feel a part of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In isolation, almost always, you almost always feel apart from. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say, well, I want to feel apart from that group that I don't um, connect to, that would be okay. But when you're apart from, and I believe this has great implications in psychotherapy as well, most people, I would say, come in feeling a sense of either grief or distress because they're pe feeling apart from, they're feeling isolated. Mm -hmm. Now that can be either literally, I have no friends, da, 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 or, or even worse, and this is where it really galvanized my thinking, what does the phrase alone in a crowd means? It mm. means you, you, mm. could feel, you could be with a thousand people mm. and feel completely isolated. And I know I have. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the proof that says you can be by yourself and feel isolated. You could be in a room full of people and feel isolated. So it's not the number of people. It's mm -hmm. the quality of which you connect to other things mm. and feel a part of. You could be by yourself and experience solitude because you're connected to either God or the nature or, you know, or a set of your thoughts that really calm you, maybe memories. But to differentiate between solitude and isolation also helps define the space between you and whatever that is, be it a person, an idea, or a thing. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, in ancient China, uh, the idea was uh, uh, elaborated on a different text of the fertile void. Mm. And I think this gets more, at more of what you're talking about in terms of solitude, is that, in, in fact, if you take the idea of a fertile void, 
We talked about structured improvisation earlier. Now we're talking about another oxymoron, fertile void. Hmm. Um, one of my favorite authors uh, in, in uh, probably right up next to Daniel Stern is uh, a mouthful, Mihaly Chiksan Mihayi. Uh, he's a, a social psychologist whose most of his career was at the University of Chicago. He's now at the Claremont uh, uh, Graduate Schools. And he, um, in fact, I brought one of his books. Some of you might be familiar with him. He's, he's the um, originator of this idea of flow mm. and the idea of optimal performance, peak performance, and how it is that whenever we move into a state that we later describe as desirable or when we were happiest, typically it's in a state of flow. You can be in flow at work. You can be in flow at play. You can be in unflow at work and unflow at play. So this is Mihayi, Chikson Mihayi. He, he's written also my favorite book uh, on creativity, and I highly recommend it to you if, if you have an interest in creativity. And he makes the point there that in theories of creativity, what's essential for any creative act is what he calls incubation, the fertile void. I think it's what you're calling solitude. Who of us doesn't know that? You're put on the spot and you have to remember somebody's name. <laughs> Can't remember it. And given a moment or two, in fact, put your mind on something else yes. and bam, in it comes. Um, so it is with any creative project. Uh, any time that we're asked to create something new, there has to be there have to be edges around that allow it that allow us to breathe with it. Else, you're stuck in the old structures. And creativity, by definition, we already defined it as homospatial process. The idea of bringing two things into the same space that requires an incubation. That requires a space for that to happen. Sure. Um, and. So it is with, with solitude or the fertile void or incubation. Mm -hmm. I like a poem. This is by the 13th century Persian poet Rumi who says, every moment the sunlight is totally empty and totally full. And the Western part of me wants to say, so make up your mind, which is it? <laughs> You can't have both. You can have either, but you cannot have both. <laughs> but that's the Western thought in my mind that says choose. Yeah. choose. I, I like that. I, I, I'm a very concrete thinker in many ways. I grew up as a little boy uh, uh, in the same town where I learned how to drum in Porterville. We had a fireplace and we had a bellows. Do you guys know what a bellows is? Uh, is it bellows is or are? <laughs> is our data R. I we, had, we, had, we had a bellows and I, I can still remember this uh, bellows is that you it's what you open up and close to shoot air into the fire to, to get it going and I came across this uh, phrase it's from uh, it's from uh, Lao Tzu in a Chinese literature and he says the way of the master is like a bellows it is empty yet infinitely capable and I hold that image inside um, uh, I, I have to tell you guys, I have all these mnemonics in my life. I have the grace of driving an infinity, as does my friend Stephen. And whenever I come out to my car, I think of that poem. It's just, it's, it's, the way of the master is like a bellows. It is empty, yet infinitely, infinity, infinitely <laughs> capable. Is that I, I? I don't know about you all. I think it's the nature of the ego, is that it wants to it wants to be capable by doing, doing, doing. And we're really talking about a being state. It seems like to me. Hmm? Yeah. Again, make up your mind. It's got to be either or, right? Because that's how we're conditioned to think. And I'll say, you know, just what comes to mind from what you said. That. And by the way, Carol Ryan drives an Infinity too, so we're a triad of that. We all know. And you, inf this is not a plug infinitely for infinity, capable. Although, although Infinity has underwritten the master lecture series today, so, <laughs> so it's a plug. Um, but. It occurs to me that nothing, when I took on this topic, and, and you've taken on topics before that scared you but excited you at the same time, it challenges every single thing you think you know and puts you in a state of almost despair for a moment of, I know nothing about anything. Mm. And then all of a sudden you have these moments of reading the capacity to be alone. You go, I got it. I got it again. And then again, you're on the floor in despair because you know nothing. But I think that's the process of education. I think, I think that's what we're here at this university to do, is challenge ourselves in ways that, mm -hmm. not even necessarily to get outside the box, because I'm not sure what that means, mm -hmm. but stretch the box. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what's so valuable yeah. about being in this learning environment, is you're allowed to stretch the box. Yeah. Getting outside of it, I don't know, that's, you're on your own on that, you're da that's dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. But to stretch the box, yeah. and to say, that yeah. box can hold both of those things. Mm -hmm. It can contain both without yeah. being con uh, contrasting nor complementary, yeah. either one. Yeah. 
That's, I think, what education mm -hmm. does for us. It mm -hmm. allows our mind to hold what is seemingly two disparate thoughts without those thoughts being at war with one another yeah. or with them always being at war with one another. Yeah. So what do you do with all that? <laughs> you know what you do? You keep learning. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to wind down in just a second. We're going to yeah. move to the question and answer in just a second. I have one last uh, thought I want to share, and it's out of therapy outcome research. This is where you, you, you interview uh, 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 clients that have completed a course of therapy and ask them how it went and what worked. And uh, I want to tie it into one of my favorite authors in psychology is Rollo May. I got a chance to hear Rollo May. He's an existential therapist who's, who uh, was uh, absolutely critical. He's the bridge uh, bringing in European existential philosophy into American psychology. It's really Rollo May's uh, work. And I got a chance to hear him. It was his last public lecture, and I will never forget what he said, and I'll leave you with this before we go into the question and answer period. He said that, that when, or in regards to therapy outcome research, when you interview clients, what do they say made the difference? Is it the, is it the, the great theor theories and techniques, Corianne, <laughs> that we're learning in graduate school? Uh, those are important, but that's not what people talk about. What they talk about is they say, it's the moment that you laughed with me. It's the moment where you as my therapist, I saw a tear in your eye as I shared my own sorrow. It's the moment where you held silence with me mm. and we just were together. And Rollo May's term for this, I love this, it's unforgettable. He says, he says, the client is surprised. And he said, by surprise what I mean is he broke down surprise into its etymology. Again, back to the Latin. Surprise comes from sur, which means above. Think of to surmount is above. And prize comes from the same root of the word that we use for prehension, like a prehensile tail. Huh. Literally, it means to, uh, to grab a hold of or to be taken a hold of. And so the idea of surprise in its etymology, and this is what Rollo May shared, and this is what makes a difference in therapy, which requires honoring of this third body, is that in order for surprise, uh, in order for therapy to take hold or for surprise to take place, we must be taken from above. That's the sense, is that the therapy is no longer two human beings alone. They're taken from above. I'll never forget that. Thank you, Rollo May. Okay. We're ready for questions and answers. Yeah, and let me just add one thing as Tom comes up. You know, you do all this thinking about these large topics, and then you do come ag across something where somebody has said what you've tried to say in 200 pages in four words. And you go, what? <laughs> have what have I what have I done here? I've made this. So the four words that came to mind as I was completing my dissertation were these. And they were spoken, of course, by Paul Simon. And it's the title to his greatest hits album. And it explains the third and the silence and all that better than any way I ever could. So I almost quit graduate school. Um, the title of his uh, greatest hits album was Love Songs and Negotiations. Because that's what the third is. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the Q&A. And we'll, as usual, we'll start with some from the uh, online audience and give the in-person uh, group here a chance to gather their thoughts. Uh, I was struck, and I'm going to start with these three questions because of the first dozen questions that came in, 11 focused on uh, something that you you uh, you spoke to the uh, the discomfort the, uh, mm. that silence can create. <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe the fir eleven of the first twelve uh, must be true, right? So I, I guess and and you you spoke to this, but if you could elaborate some more, what, why mm. is it mm. that silence is so very uncomfortable for so many people? Mm. Mm. Why am I uncomfortable right now? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you, that's the real question. Mm. I, I think it goes back. Well, God, it's several things, but it does go back to. All things are possible in silence. But you know what? All things are possible in silence. And it's hard to escape truth when you're really uh, embodying silence. And that truth can be transformative. That truth can be painful. Um, that's why I typically fill up the space with words so I don't have to think about what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. I, I think of the Danish philosopher uh, Soren Kierkegaard for some reason he comes to mind and he has uh, one of my favorite phrases from him is he says it's much easier to be worried about something rather than nothing mm -hmm. to really be with no thing 
uh, is really challenging, really challenging to listen Ouch. to that still small voice inside. And I think of it from a psychological perspective is that our psyches, our egos are set up as kind of machines to move forward and, and thank God for our egos. But, but when they have the final purview in our lives, the last thing they want to do is be focused on no thing. They're all about growing and becoming something. And so it's, uh, Carl Jung called it the opus contra naturum. It's the work against nature to drop into the place we're talking about. It's not, um, it is our deepest nature, but it's not our human nature to do that. It, it, it's really, it's going upstream against yeah. everything that wants to accumulate more and more. There's a, there's a great phrase, and it's, out, it's an ancient Chinese saying. Let's see if I can get it. In the, it's, it's going to take a second. In the pursuit of wisdom, no, here it is. In the pursuit of knowledge, every day something is added. In the practice of wisdom, every day something is dropped. I could set it right there. The difference between pursuing knowledge, with all blessing to that, and the practice of wisdom, every day something is dropped. I'm just sure, Tom, that made those 11 people just totally exhale, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Just give me a call. We'll talk through this together, but we won't be silent together. Uh, uh, I'll follow up on this. What, yeah. uh, Dr. Weathers, you referred to a, a, a distinction between a silence of discomforts and one that settles. Is there, uh, is there a way to recognize when one, uh, in relationship you might be in, a, in the former, a silence that discomforts, and is there a way to move from one space to the other? You want to start first? Well, uh, what Bob alluded to that occurred to me, and I found it through music, which Bob set me off on that journey, is music is about tension, building tension and release. Mm -hmm. Building tension and release. And those silences, although there are many thousands of them, um, are really composed in the two categories of a silence can build tension and then I can say, you know what I'm thinking? And there's a tension built there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a sandwich. And there's a release, because you thought, what was he going to say just now? That my hair was it? <laughs> so I think the silence that stirs creates that sense of tension. And it's not tension, not in necessarily a stressful way, yeah, but just yeah. that anticipation. And I think silence that settles says, and Tom, you're a good guy. <sighs> it's the inhale and the exhale. Mm -hmm. And just try holding your breath, and you'll know when you're in the tension state. And when you let your breath out, you're in that settling state. Just mm -hmm. watch your breath. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Um, I, I thought I have it. It's it's fresh out of this conference this weekend where we were talking about addiction recovery and uh, uh, among other things, spiritual resources including meditation. And in the mindfulness meditation tradition, there really is a goal to quiet the mind, and that's 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 kind of the entry point. Is if I just drop into focusing on my breath for 20 minutes each morning, over time that begins to take hold, just like exercise and running do develop certain muscles. And so you learn how to quiet the mind. But there's a more profound lesson that comes from mindfulness meditation. I think that's the entry uh, entry point, and that is is that we can drop into a place. And I've learned a lot of this from Colleen, is we can drop into a place where we observe the mind in its busyness. And so I may not be able to quiet my mind. I tried to quiet my mind as we were sitting up here before we started. I can't do that. But what I can do is I can drop into a place where I can at least be one step removed from being identified with the mind that's, well, in the Eastern traditions they call it the monkey mind that swings from one branch to the next. My mind is a big fat monkey and it likes to do that. Really? But what I can do, but what I can do is on a good day with, with some grace is I can drop into a place that is disidentified with that, that can observe that. And to observe it is over half the battle won in terms of not being governed by oh. it. Just two more, then I'll turn to our mm -hmm. audience here. Uh, we live in a society, society today where there's less and less silence available, number one, and number two, there are more and more tools and, and gadgets and things and media that we can fill those, we have fewer moments, uh, mm -hmm. potential moments for silence, but we also have more things that we can plug into those potential moments. So what what do you think the long-term implications might be of, of that, of, of a society where there isn't much silence and we, what silence there is, we can fill with stuff? What, what, what happens a generation down the road as a result? 
I think we're moving that direction. I think the minute we put earbuds in, even though there's noise in there, it's, it's a filter of the noise. It's chosen noise rather than the noise around us. So I, I think actually we're headed the right direction. I don't know that we'll get to four minutes and 33 seconds, but I do think that some of the devices, although they feel disconnective, are our innate <coughs> need to create spaces that are more negotiable for us, silent or more uh, definable spaces. And so, I don't know, I don't, I, I, it's getting louder, but I think we're finding ways naturally to cope with it, and I think we're heading the direction of people will go back to that idea of, okay, I'm gonna put the earbuds in, but I'm not gonna turn anything on. I have a thought. It's, uh, well, in the spirit of complementarity or contrasting, I'm going to offer an opposing view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and as John Lennon said, everything is true and so is its opposite. <laughs> okay. There's a book that came out. I have it right here. I brought it with me. In fact, let's see. Uh, here it, is. it just came out in the last few years. There's a trilogy coming out of uh, MIT. Uh, Sher Sherry we'll Turkle is a psychologist who, uh, interestingly, chose... Alone Together is the title, and she means a different alone together than what Winnicott meant, uh, for sure. And the idea, what she's doing is she's analyzing the effect of social media and uh, the, uh, the pace of our modern lifestyle on our ability to connect not only with one another, but with ourselves. And uh, she's a scientist. This is a scientific uh, 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 amplification of what's going on societally, looking at that in terms of its implications 10, 20, 30 years mm. down the line. And she argues very strongly that we're in for trouble with this in terms of, of uh, the, the way that we, the way that we can create the illusion of being together um, but, but really to be in isolation from one another. And so I'm not going to go into specific social media because mm. I am a Luddite to the extreme with that. But I want to recommend this as a resource. You have really thoughtful commentators <coughs> that are looking at the implications of this that will roll out one and two generations down the line. And so, Corianne, the work that you do in therapy with the clients that you see is going to be qualitatively different than the work I've done over these last years owing to the fact that, that, this, is, that this is epidemic and we don't even know yet the implications. So anyway, her argument would be is that we're moving towards more and more of a society that is characterized by being together, it looks like, and actually quite uh, isolated in the way that you were talking about. Hmm. Well, we both can't be right, can we? <laughs> Let's do a vote on see. <laughs> I think they can both be true. Yeah, they both are. Okay, one more for now from the online audience, and I, I beg that you not ask me to elaborate on this one because I have no idea. Who <laughs> oh, you know we're going to do it now. <laughs> the, the, the scholar <laughs> to whom he you. refers. Go ahead. Has Wilhelm Reich and his theory of or organomy, organ, organ folding. <laughs> Not origami. <laughs> Organomy. Has that had any? Has that informed in any way your uh, uh, your perspectives on silence and the mind, body, and spirit? I, I read a book some years ago by uh, Robert Stolaro, and the book is called Faces in a Cloud. Mm -hmm. And he went into deep analysis of Wilhelm Reich's theory of or origami. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I have nothing more to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry that I can't comment on that. It's been um, too long. And I'll take a little bit of the opposite view by saying that which we don't speak of or let ourselves realize in the silence will be cataloged in our bodies. Very well done. That's great. That's, that's actually, yeah. His Good. focus was on the body. Good morning. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Such an Thank interesting you. topic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bonnie Delgado, and I'm taking classes. Bonnie. I'm in Psi 87, <laughs> down, 508A. <laughs> I'd like to jump back to what the questions of the, the people online brought up, the, the, the comfortable silence versus the uncomfortable. Uh, I just retired as an assistant principal mm. last year, Ooh, and I, thank you, <laughs> that's nice, and I used silence mm. to get information. It was amazing with students. So often people ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, and never get an answer. Yeah. Yeah. However, I would just ask a question and sit there. And wow. nine times out of ten, I would get the answer I want. So my question to you, and I know you want to say something, <laughs> is do you use that in your practice as well? Well, first let me say this. Um, that, 
that statement could only come from a vice principal, right? <laughs> principals don't think that way. Vice principals, who are typically the hammers, uh, <laughs> need to use any tool in their box they have. And certainly, silence can, because it is undetermined, it can be used in any way. It can be used as a tool to gather information, but if you head further on that spectrum, it can also be uh, used as a tool to control and manipulate people. I'm not saying yours is that, but what I'm saying is there's a spectrum of silences. Yours is to let come up whatever truth needs to come up. But there are some people that come into therapy that have been given the silent treatment in life. And how is that very debilitating? So a silence from a therapist is almost like a recapitulation yeah, of a trauma they really experienced awesome. in life. And so you know, whether it's a therapist or a friend or just somebody who's listening to somebody, um, silence is a really tricky tool. I mean, it's, you've got to be really careful with it because mm -hmm. you might be saying, let's sit in solitude together. And they might be saying, so is this the silent treatment I got And mm -hmm. when I was younger? Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, as beautiful and as sometimes flowery as we're mm -hmm. and transformative as we're making it, it might be the trickiest tool in the toolbox to use in therapy. I've got a confession to make. I just recall as you were talking, 30 years ago I was sitting in an office. I was a psych assistant in Pasadena. And I remember a young man came in, a, a teenage boy came in to sit with me. He sat down and I don't know what possessed me that night to employ solitude therapy or whatever, but I, I sat silently and I could feel that I sat too long and that it was actually, uh, uh, there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with him. I didn't know. I, it was my own limitation, my own uh, <coughs> ignorance, my own anxiety and so on. And I knew that I lost him in that session. He never came back again. But I have to tell you, of the clients that I saw during that period, he's one of the most memorable because I learned a really important lesson that Steve just articulated is that I pushed him into that so, out of my own limitation. It wasn't intentional, but it was debilitating to the therapy. I never did forget that lesson. You know, sometimes you learn your best lessons by your biggest flub ups. That was one of them. Ouch. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Diana Trout. And again, I want to thank you. This is just a phenomenal topic. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of exploring both um, the space and the silence and all of that. Uh, I'm going through certification as an emotionally focused therapist, which I know, Colleen, you're part of that community. So you're probably very familiar with it. And I couldn't help but put a lot of what you're saying in context with yeah. attachment theory. Mm -hmm. And um, my thoughts, and I, I just wanted some comments from you about people's need to be guarded mm -hmm. and how often we fill the silence with words because it's so, you know, people have felt so insecure they really don't have a comfort level with vulnerability and certainly mm -hmm. silence brings up not only our own inner thoughts but um, that that touching of that vulnerable space yeah. so I'd love to get your comments on that yeah. hmm. I have two different thoughts and they come at the same time is it Diane or Diana Diana, Diana. I have two different thoughts yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one is that in attachment theory, for example, you talk about a dismissive uh, oh. style, is that silence can, silence, it means so many different things, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, if that's my style, which is to, to, to dismiss emotional intimacy with you or with myself, then my silence, which might look profound, is actually quite defensive. It's in oh. service of staying away from emotional connectedness. And, and then... And then flip it around and look at a, um, an anxious attachment style that uh, is pursuing intimacy, but talking, 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 right. talking. Yeah. It has the outcome of the, the first, which is no intimacy is possible. And so it really takes interpreting the silence, doesn't it? And I think Steve has done a wonderful job in his book to come of in, uh, really appreciating the subtleties um, uh, within silence. Does that help as at least as a start? I can really see silence serving intimacy. Yeah. I can also see silence um, uh, serving defenses against intimacy. Is that fair? Yeah. Is that fair? And, and, and I think that underscores another point that says that those of us that have decided in whatever form to go into the helping professions, beware. This is tricky. This is risky and tricky and ultimately uh, noble pursuits of ours, but for those very things and a hundred more, uh, we need to take great care, great care. 
Hi, I'm Damien, and um, okay. I'm in uh, uh, class 85, oh, sorry, 86, 505. And um, hey, uh, I, I, I would say that um, mm -hmm. I want to bring up a specific issue that uh, I am an atheist and I, I do not believe in spiritual, I don't mm -hmm. believe in God. I, I, and mindfulness to me sounds more be trying to make mystical something that's a natural process. Mm -hmm. For me, I would see it, for me, the word mindfulness would be like a thought experiment. In other words, putting an idea and letting it float and seeing where it lands, mm -hmm. but that still is an intentionality it's not it's it, in other words to me the lack of noise somewhere doesn't mean something's not happening a process mm. is occurring yeah. it's just to me the intentionality is to guide the process otherwise to me all I hear is mindlessness not mm. mindfulness huh. and how do you would or would how would you relate to me as an atheist who does not buy spiritual or soul or any of that, mm -hmm. but sees it all as uh, um, mm -hmm. as a, in other words, like to me, knowledge, sorry, knowledge uh, um, to me is something that can lead us to a feeling of superiority or thus selfness. And I think wisdom for me mm -hmm. is something that reminds us of the superiority of kindness. Mm -hmm. So it's an intentionality change that, that, mm. that I think of. That's, mm. I, I, the first thing that came to mind is um, all things are possible in the white space. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. But he's right and she's right um, mm -hmm. because the idea of connectivity doesn't limit to any particular thing, idea, or person. Connectivity is to anything you choose. I, ha I have a thought and it's, it's really just kind of... Um tangential thought. I was thinking of, as it came to me as I was listening to you, Damien, as I was thinking of another quote by Eckhart Tolle, is that, is that whether you, you or any of us believe in soul or spirit is really, to me, quite secondary. But I like a, a quote that he says, is that all of us know about this. He says, everything that matters in life, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arises from beyond the mind. I don't think it requires any religious belief system to know about beauty or to be impacted by love. And that I can't think my way into beauty. I can't think my way into creativity. I can't think my way into a state of joy. I can do things that create a fertile void for that to come in. And I think it's wide open then. So if we talk about just phenomenology in terms of experience, there's not a one of us in this room that doesn't know that experience, huh. God willing. Oops. <laughs> See? I rest my case. Okay, so forget everything he just said. What was your question again? Hi, Matthew Beck. I'm in the Marriage Hi, Family Matthew. Therapy Hi. Program. <laughs> I am just I'm grateful to have been present for this lecture, gentlemen. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, uh, I have the opportunity uh, three times a week to, um, to lead a guided meditation for individuals in recovery from substance use disorder. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, it's just uh, such a, I guess, a, I would say a dynamic process to see the growth of these individuals uh, week by week it's really interesting um, they prefer guided for the most part sure. and 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 just as you guided us today with your knowledge mm -hmm. everything I received from my mentors as an individual who guides meditation now I am now giving back so I think it's a give-and-take process yeah. Uh, I'm not guiding based upon I have some kind of superior knowledge. I'm guiding based upon what I've seen work for others, work for myself, work for the mentors before me. Right. So um, I guess um, my question to you would be, uh, how do you feel about guiding individuals through the quiet moments? And to what extent should we allow ourselves to guide individuals in what extent sh and at what point should we be able to let go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Colleen and I have co-led a, a, a mindfulness group over the last year. We just call it Recovery for Everyone. And it's, it's based in mindfulness meditation with the discussion after that. And it's been very interesting. And we've talked about this. We have different styles in terms of facilitating. She's far better than I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but, but uh, the, the, the experience I've had, I don't have to even think about it theoretically, the experience I've had is that for some, my style would be to be more laissez-faire and to kind of create a space and allow people to kind of 
find their way in that. And what's been clear from my experience and then our conversations is that effective guidance, effective shepherding through something as ambiguous as moving into meditation is really important and I would think would be more the rule than, than not. Um, and, and so it's, it's important. I think guidance in the service of Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Matthew, absolutely. Uh, Winnicott uses the term good enough mother, means you don't have to be perfect. So if you can be a good enough guide, your people will get everything they need. I'm sorry to have to end the uh, yep. Q&A session because I know there are a number of other questions in the audience. But uh, b- before we go, a couple of quick items. Uh, first and foremost, on behalf of the entire universe, I want to thank you both for a fantastic, mm. informative, and, and compelling Thanks, lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. And. Uh, and I've lost my place. Oh, uh, a couple items. I'd like to mention that a recorded version of this lecture will be available within about a week in the content section of the calsouthern.edu website. And there you can also browse our archive and view past lectures. And you'll also find uh, information about future lectures, which we encourage you to attend. And not only do we encourage you to attend, we hope that you invite your friends and colleagues, because the uh, larger and more diverse our global audience, the, uh, the better the dialogue. And now, before we sign off, uh, I know our presenters have a couple of last items they'd like to leave us with. Yeah. Um, Every good piece of music has a beginning, middle, and an end. The beginning is determined, the middle is undetermined, but the end has an out. So we wanted to create that out. So here's just a couple things to leave you with, um, just to think about. We won't even elaborate on them. Um, A quote by Albert Einstein, uh, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. Uh, Nature hides her secret through her essential loftiness, but not by means of ruse. When you're silent, when you're still, everything is available to be revealed to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all he was doing in his thinking. Took me six months to understand what that meant, but I I think I've only got it. Give Um, us six months. Yeah, (laughs) that's rich. And then for me, again, not trying to impose, but if... For me, if you boil down silence in the space between to one image that gets it to a pinpoint thinking point, it's this one. Hmm. Hmm. That Hmm. piece of art would mean something totally different if those two fingers were touching. I don't know what it would mean, but something totally different. Hmm. The fact that there is a space between Hmm. might mean that is the world. In, between, in that little bitty space right there. Mm-hmm.